Well, good morning. My name is Mark Wilcock, and uh, thank you to uh, Pastor Mike, who introduced me earlier this morning. Uh, he and I previously served in a ministry context, as he mentioned, and uh, continue to be friends to this day, and I appreciate the privilege to be here this morning. And uh, I know that you are in good hands as he partners with you and helps you and leads you through this uh, journey, your journey, towards the next chapter of ministry for Inukit Presbyterian Church. And so blessings on you as you uh, continue this journey uh, with Mike. Just a little bit about myself, a little bit more than Mike said, um, just so you have an idea of who this guy is that's uh, leading you this morning in God's Word as we uh, have a conversation um, uh, and continue our series this morning. I am married to an Arnett girl here in Inukit Presbyterian, uh, Gordon Ruth Arnett, one of their children. Jennifer is my wife. And uh, we have two teenage sons. Uh, Ian, our eldest, is with me this morning. And uh, we have a house rabbit named Ollie. Um, I, as Mike mentioned, I previously served in pastoral ministry for 23 years before transitioning to serving with Indwell. Indwell is a Canadian Christian supportive affordable housing provider. And uh, we, um, well, our mission statement is to uh, support people seeking health, wellness, and belonging by uh, inviting them to join us in a community, in uh, affordable housing. And we are in eight communities around the province, including here in Woodstock. Well, here's Interkip, but in Woodstock, uh, we have two communities, one Blossom Park, and the other one is at Harvey Woods, the old Harvey Woods factory converted to uh, lofts. And that's kind of our bread and butter, or so to speak, is that we love to take buildings that perhaps have seen one life of use and uh, redeem them and turn them into affordable housing. And uh, so we develop and build uh, affordable housing, and then we provide supports, health supports for people that live on site. Um, most of our tenants have previously been homeless or precariously housed, and um, we help them find permanent housing and then also help unpack a little bit the reasons why they perhaps uh, were homeless to begin with and help them find a fuller measure of health and wellness in their lives. But that's not why I'm here this morning. I'm here to continue our, um, our sermon series called Out of Context. And um, this morning as we continue the series, I'm going to take a, a bit of a twist with it and use a common phrase that I hope many of you know and uh, turn it around and see what God and His Word has to offer for us as teaching this morning. And uh, it's a saying that, at least for me, was repeated a lot on the playground when I was a kid, and maybe you've heard it too, if you're my age or older, hopefully younger too. Um, the saying is this, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me, or words will never hurt me. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. We know it. We've said it clearly, you know it, because a number of you said it. Um, we also know it's only partly true, right? It is true, sticks and stones can break our bones. That part is right. But names will never hurt me. Words will never hurt me. That part really isn't true, is it? They can, and they do at times. And the more we hear words and names that are spoken to hurt, they can eventually start to uh, shape what we think about ourselves, right? The con converse is also true, that um, words spoken to uplift and promote uh, can feel like uh, wind beneath our wings, like the old Bette Midler song said, that can add confidence and joy, that also can begin to shape how we view ourselves and think of ourselves. Mohamed Katani was the 2015 winner of the International Toastmasters Award. A Toastmasters is an organization that develops the skill of public speaking. And in his winning speech entitled, The Power of Words, he said this, A simple choice of words can make the difference between someone accepting or denying your message. You might have a beautiful thing to say, but say it in the wrong way, and it's gone. Words have power. What you say verbally or in writing can influence how people perceive you, factor into decisions that they make about you, can build and destroy relationships. And in an age, and this is 2015, even more in 2022, in an age where words seemingly just spill out of us on social networks and in presentations 
in casual conversations and in article comments we increasingly create and share with the world, we must give our words great forethought. Wow. Similarly, not too long ago, I was listening to the radio, and on the radio, these two radio hosts were talking back and forth about this archaic form of communication called email. Email that is still a powerful form, a written form of communication, and how we uh, write our emails can affect whether or not people actually respond to them. And they were discussing the reality that many emails get sent, but few get replied to, right? And they discussed uh, various reasons, and they also discussed what emails did receive a reply and why. And they talked about the reason that the, the number one phrase that ensured a prompt and respectful reply 65% of the time was when the sender used gracious words in their email and ended with thanks in advance. 65% of the time. All they had to do was be nice in the email and end by saying thanks in advance. All this to say that our words matter. And I think all this reflects a spiritual principle that God communicates to us through the Bible, that our words matter. Even if you're here this morning or you're watching online, wherever the cameras are, or at another time, and uh, you're not a follower of Jesus, I think that you can at least agree with me that our words do matter. And uh, hopefully this morning as you join in in the conversation or online, whenever you're watching this, that uh, I believe that there can be something helpful for you to take away, even as we discuss this um, from a biblical perspective and apply it this week to in your life. Because we've all had words that have been spoken to us in our lives that felt uh, life-giving, right? And we've been also recipients of the words that hurt, words that um, took away our joy. And while we've been the recipients of both and know the effects of both, we still, at times in our own lives, when communicating with others, can still wrestle with saying the right words. And the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament is filled with wisdom on the power of our words and the power of words in our lives with the reminder and constant reminders of what effects words and phrases can have in our lives. And if you have your Bibles with you or have the Bible app or can watch the words on the screen, turn to Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11. And I'd like to look at this one verse and unpack it uh, in a biblical, from a biblical perspective. And in Proverbs 25, verse 11, the proverb writer says this, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a ruling rightly given. Or in another translation, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. And in this verse, uh, the proverb writer is using a common literary method known as a simile. A simile is uh, defined as a figurative comparison between two unrelated uh, items often used with, uh, or often using helping words to relate them, like, like, or as. And the seeming uh, unrelatedness of the comparison is perhaps more important than the helping words. So for example, we might say, she runs as fast as the wind. It's a great simile. Running fast and the the speed of a gushing wind are similar, but unrelated. Similes can often take something common and also compare it to something more incredible or even outrageous for effect or for emphasis. Like, for example, if I was to say, Sam ate his lunch like a ravenous lion, we would most likely interpret that simile to mean that Sam was extremely hungry and he really didn't care who was around him, he just was going to stuff as much food as he could in his face because he was really, really hungry, right? We may have never personally seen a ravenous lion eat anything, but we can imagine the extreme nature of Sam's hunger and his enthusiastic approach to cleaning his plate. Parents, we'd love that, right? <laughs> and this exaggerated form of comparison is what we find here in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11. The writer Solomon, 
wants to emphasize the extreme value and worth of spoken words into people's lives by showing how these types of words are like something that was rare and beautiful in his day, like a fresh golden apple presented on a setting of silver. That's how juicy, how moist, how um, you know, uh, life-giving our words can be, like a rare golden apple to be found in his day and presented on a silver platter. Those were words that Solomon wanted to be known for speaking. Words that I, I think, I hope, we want to be known for as followers of Jesus. So what kind of words should we be using that will seem like a golden apple presented on a silver platter? What are the types of words that we should be using in our everyday speech as followers of Jesus? Well, as we look at the Bible, there are a lot of different words that we could talk about that are important words to speak into people's lives. Words of life, words that heal, words that um, are like precious golden apples laid on a silver platter with care. And I'd like to focus in on four specific words that uh, come up often in Scripture that I, that I think are worth considering to remember when we uh, think of the types of words that please God, that He would love for us to use in our everyday speech and can have the kind of effect in another person's life that Solomon was envisioning when he wrote these words. The first is this, a word of encouragement. The word encouragement comes from two phrases that have been put together. The first is uh, en, the, the, to, which means to give or to put inside. And the second comes from the idea to strengthen or to dare. So when you put them together in the word encouragement, it literally means to give strength to another person to bravely dare to do something daunting or difficult. Encouragement can also mean uh, optimistic affirmation, meaning that we, uh, when we encourage, we are strengthening someone on the outside because of something that's happening on the inside that's stirring within them to encourage, them, to, to get them to do something. I think of in the 12th century, and architects uh, for the first time came up with a new building design, a new piece for building design called a buttress, and there's a picture there on the screen. And you often can see buttresses on real ancient cathedrals on the outside. A buttress is a large outside support that allows for more room and space on the inside. And encouragement is kind of like a buttress. It's an outward word meant to strengthen or fortify someone on the inside. Give room for life on the inside. In the Bible, we see a great example of a a life of encouragement in the character of Barnabas in the New Testament, who was called a son of encouragement. He lived through his actions and his words in, in such a way that his nickname became son of encouragement. He so built people up with encouraging words that that became his nickname. That's how he became known. Wouldn't you love to be known that way? As a person who breathes words of encouragement to others and speaks words of encouragement to others. The Apostle Paul often began his letters in the New Testament when he was writing to uh, churches, began with words of encouragement. I think of his letter to the uh, Thessalonian church in uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. He said, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before God and, and, our, our, and Father, your work produced by love, your labor uh, prompted by, uh, sorry, produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he said, as I begin my letter to you, and had some tough things to say to them, uh, to, to uh, corrective things to say to them, but in the beginning, he says, as I begin, can I just say, you guys are awesome, right? If we, that's our language today. You guys are awesome. You are faithful people. You're faithful to the Lord. You work hard. You really stick to it with a sense of hope like no one else I've seen. You guys rock. Can I just start with that? Let me encourage you in advance. 
he says. Let me encourage you in advance. Or I think the writer, writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 10 and his words to us about encouragement today as followers of Jesus in the church. He says, and let us inc- consider how we may spur one another on, encourage one another toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, but encouraging one another, right? Encouraging one another. And all the more, keep doing it. Pour it on as the day approaches, as the final day approaches, when Jesus will come back and take us to be in, with him whenever that is. We don't know, so start today encouraging. So if we want to be like Barnabas, or better yet, we want to be like Jesus, known as people whose words remind people of a luxurious place setting of silver that presents golden apples, leaving people feeling like they matter, feeling like they're known. Let's be people of encouragement. Speak words that encourage. Another word that should... um, should sprinkle through our language, should be words of hope. Words of hope. Encouragement believes in the person and speaks to the person. Hope believes in a future that may yet be unknown. And we live in an increasingly uh, complicated world that often can leave us scratching our heads. And oftentimes, people's reactions today to uncertainty uh, in our world and in our lives is expressed through... uh, through anxiety or worry, complaining, fretting, turning inward, or lashing out to others. But the Bible constantly reminds us that there is hope. There is a certainty of hope in tomorrow. And that people who have that internal, heartfelt hope, followers of Jesus, we should have that hope. That we should be speaking affirming, confident, joyous words of hope to those around us who may need to be encouraged with words of hope. I think of in my own life and my journey in serving with Indwell, and we are um, in Waterloo Region, just beginning to serve people in Waterloo Region, and uh, recently began supporting people in two buildings that are owned by the region, actually. And one of our first steps in starting our work with tenants is just simply to get to know their names, to know who they are, to know their story, to learn a little bit about their journey, to learn a little bit about their needs so that we can support them well, and let them know that we are going to be there each day with words to affirm and encourage them that permanent housing is the first step but not the only step on their journey to a fuller measure of health and wellness in their lives. That they need to be in a supportive community that offers hope that there is a better tomorrow. And we offer that through our actions and particularly, as I'm speaking this morning, about our words. Because as followers of Jesus, we should be known for being people of hope because we know there is a better tomorrow. We know there is an eternity waiting for us. Our future is certain. And so, more than ever in a world that feels more and more hopeless, we should be people who live and walk and talk with hope. Right? We hope in the the better every day because we have a God who is bigger than anything that we will face today or tomorrow because we know where we will be for eternity We know that he has been victorious, that he is victorious, that he wins the day, and one day we will be with him forever. So, what does that look like? Well, I gave an example of, uh, in my life and the work that I'm doing with Indwell, uh, people with hope always point others to the power and goodness and grace and provision and purpose and promises of God. We look at uh, our present circumstances, but then we look up to the Lord and we say things like what the psalmist said in Psalm 73. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. Have you experienced that? You felt that way at times? 
Yet, he says, I still belong to you. Here's where the hope comes in. You still hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. You lead me to a glorious destiny. And whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail, my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. There's the hope. I am His, and He is mine forever. No matter how I'm feeling today, I know where I will be tomorrow, and I know who will be with me tomorrow. Or I think of one of my favorite passages from the Old Testament, Habakkuk chapter 3, where uh, the writer, uh, the Old Testament prophet, he looks around him and he says, you know what? Even though the fig trees have no blossoms, even though there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Because I know who is with me today and I know who will be with me tomorrow, no matter what happens. I have hope. There is always hope when I know and because I know Jesus as my Savior and Lord. There is always hope. It's found in Jesus. So words of encouragement, words of hope. It's also words of truth that we can speak. There's a word from our lips, aptly spoken, that seemed like golden apples setting, set in silver should be sprinkled with truth. Think of John 14, verse 6. Jesus told, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. There's a, a progression in that verse. Life comes from the truth, which is found in the way. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. And by walking in His way and His truth, that is the living truth of God, we find life. And so there are, are two aspects of truth that I think should find its way into our speech as I look at God's Word. The first is, kind of already spilled it out in John 14, 6, the first is gospel truth. As followers of Jesus, we should be living and speaking gospel truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That should find its way into our speech. People should know that about us, that Jesus came to earth to die on a cross for me and, and my sin, that by believing in Him as my Savior and Lord, I am saved from an eternity without God. I have hope because He is my Savior and Lord, that God's promises of faithfulness and grace and mercy and love are true because of His fulfilled promise to send His Son as my Savior, that's gospel truth. It's true for me. It can be true for you. It can be true for anyone here today who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. You can come to Him by faith. Believe in Him. Know that you need to be in relationship with Him. Know that you are uh, alone without Him. Know that um, you do not have an eternity without Him once you die. But when you know Him as your Savior and Lord... His Spirit comes and lives in you today. You have His power to work in you and through you today to love and to serve Him, to know His joy, and to know the hope that tomorrow you will be with Him forever. That's gospel truth. And that somehow that should be sprinkled in our words now and again. Maybe more often now than again. Especially in our world today. Gospel truth. And the second is uh, corrective truth, where we graciously and lovingly correct someone who has either deliberately or unintentionally strayed from living God's way. I think of Proverbs 27, verse 6, where he says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy, uh, or in, as this translation on the screen says, wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. That's corrective truth. Words or wounds from a friend that we trust. Not, a, not a, a, a comment sent to somebody that you don't know on Facebook in the comment section or a 
a tweet sent off to somebody that you've never seen, never going to know again, but you didn't like what they said, so you fire them off something. That's not corrective truth. That's just stupid. Oh, sorry. That's just <laughs> not good. That's, no, don't do that. Right? It's wounds from a friend that we trust who isn't out to get us, who isn't out just to stick it to us or to prove a point, but to lovingly correct, to help us on our journey. Someone we know in a relationship who we trust and says, hey, you know what? Like the other day you said this, or the other day you did that. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. As I look at gospel truth, as I look at the journey that we're on in faith together, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about this. What do you think? And we're able to speak words of truth into other people's lives when we know the truth ourselves, right? When we know the gospel truth already. When God's truth is already at work in us, He can then work through us. When God's truth is in me, God's truth can speak through me because His words are already becoming my words as I know His truth in my heart. And He is working on me and molding me and shaping me and changing me to be more like Him in my actions and my words. So gospel truth then comes out in what I say. And so that when I'm sharing with someone and I can gently and lovingly help them on the path, that's corrective truth. Gospel truth, corrective truth, words of truth that can be sprinkled and should be sprinkled in our lives. And lastly, just briefly talk about words of forgiveness. Words of forgiveness. Because when we are confronted by our sin, when we repent of our sin, God forgives us. He releases us from paying the penalty of our sin because Jesus paid the penalty of our sin, of our sin on the cross. We are released from a debt that we can never repay, a debt of eternity without God, without hope, that we now have because Jesus died on the cross, rose again three days from the dead. And when we believe in Him by faith, we are released from that debt. We are free to live for Him. We are forgiven. John says that in 1 John 1, 9, when we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all wickedness or unrighteousness or evil, depending on your translation, or sin. That's what God does for us through His Son, Jesus. We are forgiven by faith. And then in turn, the Apostle Paul reminds us in Colossians chapter 3, he says, So therefore, make allowances for each other's fault. Forgive anyone who offends you, because remember, the Lord forgave you. So you should forgive others. Words of forgiveness should be sprinkled in our lives. I was preparing earlier this week and heard uh, someone, um, someone in talking about it and Instead of spending time cutting people up, let's cut them some slack. Instead of cutting people up, let's cut them some slack. Words of forgiveness. Words of forgiveness extended to others, sometimes even when they don't deserve it or we don't think they deserve it. Releasing them. And in turn, releases us from the weight and the stress and the heartache of of that comes from withholding forgiveness from someone, holding a grudge against someone. When we offer words of forgiveness, we, re we are releasing them, yes, but we are also releasing ourselves. I forgive you. Let's move on. And I do this because Jesus first forgave me. Author C.S. Lewis once said this, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable. Because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. This is hard. So how can we do it? Only, I think, by remembering where we stand. Meaning, our words. When we say our prayers each night from the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We are offered forgiveness on no other terms. Words of forgiveness. 
So the obvious question to leave us with this morning is then, how is your speech? How is your speech? How is your speech at home? In your marriage? With siblings? Extended family? Maybe you're, this morning you hear you're a parent or a grandparent or a guardian and, and you have a say in, in, in how your home functions. You can decide how positive and negative communication happens in your house, or should or shouldn't happen in your house, is good speech and constructive correction consistently shared and displayed in your home. In your marriage, between siblings or extended family, how is your communication with each other? Is it positive? Is it encouraging? Do you offer words of hope? and truth, and forgiveness. What about outside the home, at school, with your classmates, teachers, colleagues, or in the workplace, with colleagues or supervisors? What about in social media? What about in other places where you meet with friends to hang out together? Places where we communicate our, our opinions and our, our values. Are we consistently, are you consistently and consistent in representing Jesus in your words? Or are you erratic, heated, unwise, misrepresenting Jesus in your expression of your values and choices and opinions that might be out of context? for what you say you believe? Are your words, are our words, something envied by others because of their value and their beauty and how we, when we speak, it feels to those around us like they're life-giving, like golden apples on a place setting of silver? Or do others pull away? Do they pull away because our words are not that way? and they don't want to hear from us. Our words are powerful and valuable assets. They are an investment that we make daily in the influence of others as we speak words. And in the context of our conversation this morning, words of encouragement and hope and truth and forgiveness. Or do we damage our influence through uh, frantic or hateful exchanges? Do we fail to communicate things that we should because we're afraid of what others might think? Not sharing gospel truth because we're afraid of what someone else might think when in fact that's what they need to hear is the gospel truth. So to focus it even more for you and for me today, what is one relationship or one environment or one way that you communicate that you could change or work on or improve this week by increasing your words of encouragement or a word of hope or truth or forgiveness to someone in your life. And as we consider that, may God fill us with His Spirit to help us find uh, the wisdom and beauty of communicating in the right way, in God's way, in ways that please Him at the right time in our lives. And that by His Spirit, may we increase the value of our words by using words of encouragement and hope and truth and forgiveness to one another and others around us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. And um, as we've been reminded this morning, we thank you again for your forgiveness. And as we hear these words today and as we wrestle with 
your word to us today. I pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would fill us with your spirit so that we can um, please you by communicating well with one another and with others in relationships uh, around us at work, at school, our friends, and elsewhere. May our words reflect what you desire for us to reflect, which is you and your words. Words of encouragement, words of hope, words of truth and forgiveness. And as we consider that this week, and as we ask each day to be filled with your spirit to do this, may we boldly and confidently live as people of hope each day. For your glory and for our good. And I pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I've been also given the privilege of closing the service today. So I'll just uh, take an opportunity to thank you for coming today. And I hope that you have enjoyed being here this morning as we have uh, sung and prayed, worshiped together, and listened to God's word. And uh, as you leave, may the love of God the Father, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you as you go this week. Thank you. Have a great day.